In this room, Arthur Wellesley asked Kitty's brother, who was actually several years younger than him, for permission to ask her hand in marriage. He was turned down resoundingly. He was a young man of little achievement or position. His prospects were poor. Kitty Packenham could do much better. Arthur was sent packing. Yet again, Arthur Wellesley had been dismissed as not quite up to scratch. The story has it that Arthur went home and threw his violin into the fire. It is certainly true that he never played again. Perhaps it was now that he resolved to make a success of himself. His chance came almost immediately. By 1793, the French revolutionary armies were sweeping across Europe, with the British and their allies struggling to contain them. Arthur Wellesley, now Lieutenant Colonel commanding the 33rd Regiment of Foot, was sent to join the troops in the Low Countries. It was one of the most disastrous campaigns of British military history. By the time the 33rd arrived, most of the fighting was over, and the British were in retreat under the command of the Duke of York. By day, they marched grimly through the bitter cold of a Dutch winter, making their way towards the port of Bremen. By night, they huddled around whatever fire they could make and slept on the ground beside frozen rivers. So beat the drum slowly and sound the fight lowly and play the dead march as they carry me along and fire your musket right over my coffin for I'm a young soldier cut down in my pride They had few supplies, little food and inadequate uniforms Many men were lost, not shot by the French, but killed by cold and disease. It was a bitter experience, but one that Arthur Wellesley was to profit from. As he said later, I learnt what one ought not to do and that is always useful. Soon he would be able to show what he had learned. The order came when he was 27, in the spring of 1796. He and the regiment were to be sent to India. It was India which would give him the chance to prove himself, to himself, to his family, and to Kitty's brother. For nearly a decade, Arthur and Kitty were to be separated, on different continents, forbidden even to write to each other. In later years, their relationship was to be interpreted as a great love story. The reality for both of them was to be rather less romantic. So far, Arthur Wellesley's life had been one of false starts and failed promise. But there was a new opportunity ahead, a chance to make something of himself if he had the courage to grasp it. Gathering together a library, he used the long voyage to India to fill the gaps in his education. Among the military manuals and histories of India, he also read Voltaire, Rousseau and Plutarch, and a rather dubious series called Women of Pleasure. By the time he arrived, he was as well prepared as anybody could be for military success in a completely unfamiliar continent and culture.
now it takes less than 10 hours to fly to India. Then, it took Arthur Wellesley 10 months to sail here. Most of the British arrived at Madras, coming ashore through pounding surf in small boats. Some drowned before they even landed. India was a dangerous and unenviable posting. Some Europeans would return, their fortunes made. But fewer than half the British soldiers who came here would ever see home again. It's such a long way away. I'm struck by the thought of young men from Scunthorpe and Cheltenham coming out here. I feel a long way from home even now with a train and an aircraft relatively close at hand. But just imagine being here with nothing but your feet to get you the next 800 miles perhaps and then a six months voyage home. I mean, it's a long, long way from Cheltenham. The British had originally come to India for one reason only, trade. India's a prosperous and fertile place, and Europeans had been trading with it for centuries. But by the time that Arthur Wellesley arrived, all this had changed. India was now a place of strategic significance, because the French were here as well. Two European nations were fighting it out for supremacy in the East. The British had control of several key ports and a trading network that stretched across the country, run by the British East India Company. But much of India was under the rule of local leaders, at liberty to play the French off against the British. Wellesley spent his first year in India getting to know parts of the country and training his troops. He was already noted by his superiors for his confidence and quick grasp of the situation, but he was still one amongst many young British officers, eager to make their name and their fortune. Wellesley's time in India might have proved just as unimpressive as his earlier career, had it not been for one vital event which occurred at the end of his first year. In 1798, his brother, Lord Mornington, was also posted here, but in a rather more important job than Wellesley's. He was to be Governor General of the whole of British India. Wellesley had tremendous respect for his eldest brother, whom as a boy he had considered the most brilliant and wonderful person in the world. Mornington was ambitious far beyond the requirements of his job. The East India Company really wanted to be able to carry on trading in safety. Mornington wanted to make India British, and his younger brother Arthur was to be his most successful instrument in achieving this. Within months of arriving in India, Mornington was making plans to extend British rule, with Arthur as one of his right-hand men. The first task was to establish British control over the rich territory of southern India. Arthur was in charge of a major part of the force, a brigade made up of his own 33rd Regiment and some East India Company troops, manned by local soldiers known as sepoys. He instituted the same regime of regular drill for these troops as he had for his own regiment. Arthur knew that for the plan to succeed, all the troops must be properly trained and well equipped. But the enemy was formidable. From his splendid fortress of Seringapatam, Tipu Sultan, the Tiger of Mysore, controlled much of southern India. Furthermore, he had a powerful ally in the French, who supplied him with arms and military expertise. Arthur Wellesley, in charge of military preparations, spent months planning the march on Tipu's stronghold. He organized the troops, arranged their supplies, and collected enough siege guns to give them a chance of taking the fortress. Having suffered the results of inefficiency in Flanders, Wellesley was determined to do better now that he was responsible. This was the route that Wellesley and his men took from Madras. 
It took them five weeks to approach Tipu's stronghold of Seringapatam. By 1799, Wellesley had been in the army for 12 years, but he'd yet to lead his men into a proper battle. All that was about to change. 